Welcome to the Ag Emerge Podcast, brought to you by Ag Solutions Network. Your farming challenges are unique, so your practices should be too. We're here to share emerging ideas, build connections, and provoke conversation. Get ready to improve your soil, your crops, your livestock, and your family's livelihood. I'm your producer, Kim Chase. And I'm your host, Monty Bottens. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. Today, we welcome Jimmy Emmons. Jimmy is the Senior Vice President of Trust in Food and leads their Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities Connected Ag Project, also America's Conservation Ag Movement and Trust in Beef. Coalition-driven conservation programs developed to accelerate the adoption of conservation agriculture at scale. Monty and Jimmy discuss what the successful implementation of these practices look like and how leaving a legacy is so much more than leaving a piece of property. They've got a lot to cover, so let's jump right in. Well, today I'm honored to be joined by Jimmy Emmons. Jimmy, welcome to the Aggie Perch Podcast. Oh, thanks a lot, Monty. I'm I'm very excited to be here and uh, what an honor to be invited on. I'm looking forward to it. Now, many of you know Jimmy, and if you're watching on YouTube, you're wondering who is this guy impersonating Jimmy because he's wearing a Farm Journal ball cap instead of the signature uh, Black Hat Mafia attire. So um, he said he had a good excuse. You're traveling, right? Traveling a lot this week in airplanes and and all is a challenge. So I uh, chose to uh, be incognito, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I don't hardly recognize you. <laughs> That's what a lot of people say. <laughs> well, Jimmy, um, love everything that you've done, and, and you've provided a lot of leadership to many, many farmers. But uh, for those that, that don't know you and know your why, uh, uh, give us a little backstory. Tell us tell us your story and and why you got to where you are today. Well, it's a long story, so I'll try to keep it relatively short, but I grew up in a small town in northwest Oklahoma, about two and a half hours northwest Oklahoma City called Leedy. Uh, I've only ventured about four miles from the original homestead. My wife uh, kind of met me in the middle. She traveled four or five miles. Uh, we we made our place uh, 41 years ago uh, where we're at. Uh, since that time, a lot's changed, of course. Uh, we, we operate uh, about 2,000 acres of farm ground uh, where we grow about 14 different crops in a big rotation uh, and have around three to 500 cows. It kind of depends and varies uh, from the fires and the droughts. Uh, we're around about 300 now uh, and we we'll like to grow back some of that. But so I've been involved with a, a lot of conservation over the years. Uh, I started early on with uh, the National Young Farmers, uh, went through their chairs, went to work for them for a little while in program management, and then I've done a lot of fundraising for them on the corporate side for five or six years, came back, got involved in the conservation districts, uh, and then that kind of just took off wildly because I've, I've always been concerned about conservation and practices on the ground, uh, and that led from one thing to another. Uh, becoming president of the state association. Uh, then I had an opportunity uh, in the Leopold Award winner, uh, the first inaugural in Oklahoma. Uh, and as I was receiving that, <clears throat> we had a big wildfire start and uh, burned about half the ranch out. And very devastating to our county. Uh, and uh, that led to Undersecretary Northy coming out and my congressman, Frank Lucas, that developed into a uh, opportunity to serve under Sonny Purdue as a regional coordinator for uh, FSA, NRCS, and RMA. Uh, done that stint at USDA. What a great opportunity uh, to serve. Uh, then came back home, went to work for the Conservation Commission uh, with the General Mills Mentoring Pro Program. Uh, that went very well. I was excited to be there for a while. And then I got a call about this uh, crazy idea. I need to go to work for a farm journal at Trust in Food. And that opportunity um, presented itself. And uh, I was uh, not really looking for another job. I seem like I have quite a bit going on, uh, but it really enticed me, uh, Trust in Food. 
uh, man, that's what we really need to do. Uh, and that really stemmed out to a, a $40 million climate smart grant program that we're getting ready to initiate on the ground across about 19 states that we're going to focus in across the United States. Um, out of that 40 million, that'll be about 17 million on the ground in producers' hands to do regenerative climate smart practices uh, to help improve, uh, you know, carbon storage, retention, uh, reduce greenhouse gases, uh, and markets on the backside of that. Uh, so that really enticed me. Uh, also, I'm in charge of uh, a new initiative at Trust in Food called Trust in Beef. Uh, which I'm a rancher, so that that enticed me as well. Uh, where we have partners um, that uh, have pay an annual uh, membership into that, that helps uh, get people on the ground, boots on the ground, that will help connect corporate world uh, reporting emissions uh, to you know ranchers on the ground as well to understand that and the opportunity to capture some of that revenue uh, for that data and assisting that and then America's Conservation Ag Movement, which is another uh, partner led program that actually matches dollar for dollar in RCS dollars. And we've got a new uh, extension of our grant there for 3 million from NRCS, which means 6 million on the ground. So trying to put a lot of revenue in the right places for producers on the ground. I've been working in regenerative ag uh, since David Brandt got me started in 2010 uh, and have come a long ways and traveled a lot, money across the country and uh, really enjoy working with people that want to get to the next level and understand what that next level is. So you're one of Dave's kids, huh? I am one of Dave's kids. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a good person to, to claim as a, as a soil stepdad. There you go. It is. It is. What an honor. So tell me this, uh, you got a lot going on. How do you get it all done? You got a good team there at the farm helping you out? You know, it's a, <laughs> it's a little stressful at, at right now at the farm. Uh, this is Ginger and, and myself and one hired hand, Carson. Uh, we went through this uh, with the administration uh, while I was gone and, and seemed to fare uh, pretty well. You know, we had to slow down some of our work. Uh, some of the cattle don't quite get it moved as quickly as we want sometimes. Uh, they're actually moving cattle this morning and we're weaning cattle right now. Uh, the big challenge right now is uh, Ginger's dad's having a, a stint of health issues and he's had to step back a little bit. And so we're trying to help his operation out. He's still very active at 83. And uh, so we'll be planting his wheat and we're uh, helping move cattle around for him right now and selling some cattle calves and whatnot. So it is a little stressful. It's it's sometimes we uh, we don't, but I'm very up upfront about that. That uh, you know, I think we need to move cattle daily or every minimum of three days. Uh, do we always get that done at home uh, with my extensive travel and stuff? No, but we do keep them moving, and uh, we do very good on the farm side of keeping cover on the ground uh, when it rains. We've been a little challenged with dry weather, but um, it is challenging. It is challenging, but I think uh, the work that I'm doing across the nation um, will out trump uh, some of the memo loss uh, from our farm. So hopefully we're gaining a lot more than we're losing. Well, you're, you're definitely in the planting business, right? Plant. Yeah. Um, I found it interesting that uh, the fire uh, was a real turning point for you too. Not, not as in uh, you know, having to quit farming or, or those things, but just how it refocused you or got you the attention to get you to where you can help more people. Interesting how God works, huh? It is. It is. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> he's always promised that he'll only put on salt we can stand. And sometimes we think it it's more than we can stand, but normally there's an opportunity, uh, in the smoke, so to speak. And, uh, uh, this, it did come, and uh, unexpectedly, just like this job, and I'm very uh, thankful for the guidance he provides me to do some of these things. Something else that came out of those fire events that I thought was pretty interesting is how the ag community rallied around you and the loads of hay that came from 
and fencing and materials just i i mean there was a i'm sure there's a huge huge need but it was uh it was amazing to see how farmers from all over like to help other farmers do, do you, you know it's you get to experience some of that yeah it was uh it was uh overwhelming at times we'd have four or five six loads of hay a day show up and so we had stack lots and locations across the county because our entire county was um, involved. The only city that or town that wasn't evacuated was our town. They were pre preparing uh, and it got within two miles of town uh, and then the wind subsided and we didn't have to. But other than that, the other uh, towns were all evacuated communities were uh, uh, really stressed. So we had uh, you know, hay lots and distribution points for fencing and, and hay across. A lot of the <laughs> the big issue is where farmers and ranchers are very proud and, uh, you know, go help whoever else needs help. I'm, you know, I'm fine. And so what we done, once we kind of got our stuff settled down, ranchers that I really knew were in trouble that had no hay or feed, I just load the skid steer up and I would meet the trucks at their place. And I, I just gave them no choice. We just unloaded the hay. Uh, and they would be saying, well, I'll figure something out, you know, go, go help Joe. He really needs the help. Uh, I said, no, you need to help too. And we got plenty of hay. Uh, and so yes, donations were overwhelming. Great, great, uh, ag community across this, this wonderful country that really want to help one another in times of need. I think that's very important. Yeah, it's it's great to see that whenever a, you know a neighbor has a health issue or or the wildfires and and, and for, we had that several years in a row in different locations and um it, it's neat to see how how we always like to respond. So, but yeah, it, it's interesting how that uh, got you connected with with the people and where that's where that's come from here. And um, I think another part of that awareness too was. Uh, one of your favorite sayings, or at least your closing line, long live the soil. Talk to us about um, your thoughts behind that and, and where that comes from in your heart. You know, um, when I really started seeing the big change on our own land and it coming back to life and, and you know, for years uh, when my granddad was alive, he, he was a big fisherman. He retired at 65, bought a boat, learned to ski, took us all uh, uh, fishing a lot. Uh, and, and we had always had trouble finding earthworms. Uh, we'd go to the cow lot or some remote area. Um, but once we started down that regenerative soil health path, uh, the, the soil just comes alive. And if you really want to understand that, uh, go to a regenerative system somewhere and just sit down and listen. And you'll be amazed at the different sounds you hear uh, and all the wildlife and birds and, and bees and, and insects uh, versus someone that's highly uh, high input uh, chemical, uh, um, it will be quiet. It will be dead silent. Um, and so I heard that phrase and I, I loved it. I checked into it. Uh, it was not trademarked. I, I trademarked it uh, and I believe in it. Uh, Long live the soil makes a big statement. Uh, without it, Monty, we, we don't have anything. We don't have water. We don't have food. We don't have any any ecosystems uh, that provides any of the rest of it. So I, I do. I, I try to end it. Uh, every talk uh, the other day at Dave Brandt's Legacy Farm, I, I didn't get that in. It was a little bit different focus, and I was a little more deep in the, in the thought than normal. Um, but I truly believe that uh, it, it must live because if it doesn't, we're not going to. And we've done a, a hundred, 150 years of trying to kill it. And uh, I think it's time to rebuild it and uh, uh, revitalize it and start listening to it again. It's a great point. And I, I oftentimes I don't, people worry about running out of certain resources, you know, whether it's gas or whatever. I, I don't think uh, people realize how fragile it is as far as, you know, some of the inputs we use, phosphorus, 
or just simple arable land. You know, we're paving over it and we're sending it to the ocean in a rapid, rapid way. And, uh, you know, more people every year on the planet. Uh, and, and they like to eat a little better every year too. And yeah. yet we got a little less good quality soil to do it with. There, there comes a time when this, uh, the, these two things don't, don't mesh, do they? No. And it's, you know, what most people don't understand and you just commented on it, 1.7 billion tons a year is leaving our farm ground, our farmsteads, uh, entered into the water, entered into the wind, uh, and is gone, especially in the water because it winds up, uh, in the ocean somewhere where it's the Gulf or whether it's Pacific or Atlantic, uh, it, there's erosion all over the world. Uh, and in the United States, 1.7 billion tons. Uh, and that's what I said the other day, you know, that's something that we just cannot continue uh, to do. Uh, we've been blessed with deep soils and, and a lot of it, but it's a lack of bank count. You can't spend out of it, never put it back. And once it's gone, you're broke and we will be in a wreck if we uh, don't stop erosion. I'm just thinking off the top of my head here, 25 ton loads, that's 680 million truckloads. That's a lot of freight. That's a lot of semis waiting in line to unload, isn't it? Can you imagine uh, waiting to dump at the elevator with that many semis, right? Yes. <laughs> and uh, the other thing I think interesting too, I've heard Jerry Hatfield talk about, he says the acceptable soil loss is for every pound of corn we raise is three pounds of soil. So that's uh, that's that's tolerable soil loss. Nothing tolerable about that, is there? Mine is zero. That's the only tolerable number I want to talk about. But it, that is um, that we have accepted what is tolerable uh, soil loss. And uh, I, I think we missed uh, years ago uh, talking about what is tolerable. I, I think zero should be the goal. Now, we all know when you set a goal, things don't always work out. We have extreme flooding, extreme winds. Even I had a little land uh, almost go to blowing this last spring because of two years of drought. Uh, we got a little dab of rain. Uh, I planted some some covers trying to get things to grow back. Uh, we had 60 and 70 mile an hour winds for a few days. The residue cut loose uh, when I drilled through it. And uh, I mean, that was the first time since 2010 or since, well, I had a little land blow during the fire when we, we burned everything off. Uh, but I was panicked because it was my stupidity this time that I, I should have waited for a little bit more moisture, but I'm always trying to keep it covered. Uh, and, it, and it really scared me to be uh, back in that danger zone of losing some soil. But, you know, it worked out, rain came, what I planted came on up and uh, we got it covered, but it's, you're always at risk when you're bare. Let me ask you about that in your, your context out there. I know, you know, we're all big promoters of the single disc opener drill. And that's one of the problems with the single disc opener drill is that all that residue that's attached to a root is now sliced and becomes uh, capable of being airborne and requires some some moisture to hold it in place or or cover crop to be big enough to to hold it in place so it, it's a problem we even have that problem here where when we seed cover crops we'll wind up with it in the road banks and i know i know this is a probably a dirty word but what do you what do you think about a hoe drill in those kind of extreme scenarios where you you ruffle it a little bit and you keep the residue maybe more attached i realize you get a little more tillage intensity but it maybe wouldn't blow away as bad what's what have you seen in your environment in those? You know, I've seen a few hoe drills. I actually looked at one a few years ago. Um, I thought it was a little bit more disturbance, like you said. Uh, but then Dr. Haney has talked about his test uh, at, at, you know, ARS. Uh, a little dab of tillage it is by far a less impact than fallow. Uh, fallow, uh, you know, everything goes backwards, everything. The biology shuts down. 
you're you're vulnerable because you don't have it covered. Uh, so you know there could be um, some instances where that might work, Monty. I've never really tried that. I've looked at it a little bit. Uh, very seldom we have that that issue because normally we try to wait for a little moisture or promising moisture. Uh, but we were so desperate after two years to try to try to get something going. And, and part of my problem was I broke my golden rule of taking a little bit too much grazing uh, the last fall off of that. Uh, and, and I knew that at the time, uh, it's just one of them, them things that, you know, that's the reason we have principles and rules that you're supposed to go by and, and, and you should adhere to them. And I learned a lesson from that. Yeah. An opportunity to relearn is what you're saying. Continue, that's right. Continuing that's right. education. Yeah. And that's normally the best kind. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, a lot of money being thrown around in um, uh, the whole arena of climate smart farming, regenerative ag, uh, soil carbon sequestration, diversity crops. Where it, Share with people where this money is coming from ultimately and, and why that money is out there, not just government money, but the, the private money and how this is, how these companies are kind of desperately looking to, for solutions. So we'll start on the, the private side. Um, there is unprecedented, unprecedented uh, amounts of money. For years in conservation, we all kept saying, if we had the money, we could do this. If we could find the resources, we could do this. Now there is resources at the kazoo that we can do things with. One of the big issues in 2030 used to sound a long ways off. It's, it's getting very uh, closer as we speak. Um, it's not mandatory yet, but uh, we're, we see the trend where we're going in reporting uh, your emissions, uh, and that's everybody across the country, uh, and your impact on weather and climate and the air. Uh, most companies now are in the process of trying to figure out how to, to report scope one, two, three, four uh, tier emissions. You know, ones are the actual emissions there at their plants and operations, whatever they're doing, whether it's ethanol, whether it's food products, whether it's grain uh, milling, you can just go down the list of all production. Um, scope two is, is the traffic between uh, their, their uh, buildings, uh, their, their own uh, transportation of product around and, and electricity. I mean, it's just everything they do. Then there's scope three, and that's where you and I and, and all the farmers and ranchers come in, and that's uh, our emissions uh, across our land that, that a private company doesn't own, doesn't operate, but yet uh, their, their sources of their products come from that sourcing shed. And they've got to figure out how they're going to report Monty's and Jimmy's uh, emission and footprint uh, into their product line uh, from their sourcing sheds. And uh, that's a real challenge. Uh, especially when Jimmy or Monty may not be, uh, you know, storing that data or care or understand uh, what's going on. I think it's a real revenue opportunity because if you have that data or can build that data and show, you know, you're doing a good job uh, in your front footprint, you're no-tilling, you have some cover crops, you're doing a pretty good job grazing, uh, moving animals around, you're, you're very... Uh, eco-friendly, uh, that data is going to be worth uh, quite a bit to companies. And, and I think there's a, a great opportunity. That's why trust in food uh, is, is so important and trust in beef and ACAM that we help producers understand that uh, and, and, and don't give your data away. Take that as an opportunity as a commodity uh, that you have on your farm and ranch uh, that can really help us understand what's going on uh, on the land. It's it's not a it's not a mandate. Uh, it's it's an opportunity. So a lot of companies, and I deal uh, with major food companies, grain companies, uh, every week here at Trust and Food about trying to figure out 
you know, how we work together because you and I both know that sometimes when a, a, a company, a large corporation shows up, we as, as producers are a little hesitant, you know, to work with them sometimes or cautious about their motives and stuff. And so we want to be at Farm Journal and Trust and Food. We want to vet them companies that are serious and really want to do the right thing and, and be good land stewards with us. Uh, so we try to do that before we uh, take them on as a partner. That's the private side. A lot of that's happening in the background. Then we have, have USDA that put $3.2 billion uh, into a Climate Smart uh, grant program. Uh, there, there's a tremendous amount of grants across the the country that went out. Uh, like I said, we have one that for 40 million, uh, very, very extensive reporting on this. Um, and so we will, we got about 16 practices that's in the suite uh, that you can choose from, whether you're a rancher. Uh, if you were a rancher, you know, we, we've got a new genetic uh, practice code that we're trying out with ABS that will reduce uh, some of the size of the animal a little bit and feed efficiency and emissions and time on feed. Uh, we got a virtual fencing uh, in that as well, rotational grazing, cover crop grazing, uh, just a, a, a big suite of practices. And then there's on the production land side, there's uh, a lot of different management things from water management, efficiency and emissions and cover crops, uh, manure management, nutrient management. Uh, I could go down the whole list. It's a big suite of practices to choose from. So hopefully there's one or two that would fit anybody that was interested in that. Uh, we'll be paying uh, on them normally uh, per acre, but in some of them will be per head and animals and different things. It's kind of a variety. And we're paying uh, really pretty good uh, above a lot of other uh, traditional, say, a cover crop uh, seeding amount because there's a lot of reporting uh, that in testing that we're going to have to do that verifies how the practice is working, verifies the, the carbon storage. Is it going up? Is greenhouse gas emissions going down? You know, uh, lots of other there's 87 pages of, of reporting that I have to do from them uh, uh, producers. So we're hiring people on the ground in them areas to assist farmers and ranchers to understand that. We've got about a dozen great partners that have the technology, uh, you know, AgriWeb, Trimble, uh, SimPass. There's, there's, I could go down the whole list of them. That was just, just a few to mention that will have technology that will help farmers and ranchers capture that data, understand that data, and our people on the ground will, will help that. So we're going to work with about 500 producers in them 19 states. Um, half of them uh, is going to be in an underserved or uh, really socially disadvantaged arena, uh, but then a lot of other producers. So 17 million, if you figure the numbers out, uh, that's a pretty good uh, opportunity for some revenue for a producer, big or small. Uh, you know, will make a little bit of a difference as well. But, you know, as Congressman uh, Frank Lucas and I were visiting, uh, he's on the Science and Technology uh, Committee, the chairman. He's very interested in seeing uh, the data that USDA is going to get out of this that will, you know, verify what really Really works what is working pretty good and maybe something that's not working that we need to adjust on so we can do better as we go forward. So Monty, there's a tremendous, tremendous amount, billions of dollars going out. Now we just got to be responsible and, and be good stewards of that to, to really prove what you and I and others across the country know that we can do if we do a good job, we can help this thing and, and really regenerate our country and our land and our soil. 
So there's lots of places to go with all this. Now, first off, we do have to clarify um, uh, socially um, uh, challenged groups is not the same as socially awkward, correct? That's right. Okay. Okay. So I, I, I wouldn't qualify because of the social awkwardness. Uh, <laughs> I, I understand. No. <laughs> the Ag Emerge podcast is brought to you by Ag Solutions Network. The ASN team is hands-on, digging in and invested in regenerative agriculture. Along with the proper plant nutrition and biologicals to boost your soil microbiome, we provide the ideas and implementation guidance to support you on your soil health journey. So stop farming the same way and contact Ag Solutions Network today at asn.farm. So what I see happening here is there's a lot of money being thrown at this and it's, um, it's similar to, um, you know, a startup situation, situation, just, just try something and, and see what happens, report back, get that information and then uh, reiterate and try again. And, uh, that's kind of the feeling I get out of, out of all of this, um, bigger picture seems like there's a great chance for greenwashing happening here. So it's uh, the money's out there. And now it's a matter of, are we going to try to uh, come up with data to reinforce a conventional production production model or um, can regenerative actually the truth shine through in this niche approach uh, to production? Uh, what's your thoughts there, uh, Jimmy, to where we get real change that makes a real difference happening um, versus just more of the same. That's, uh, uh, as a friend might say, just polish the dog turd. Yeah, I mean, that's a big concern. Some of these these companies and programs are just throwing money out and saying, Monty, plant this cover crop and, and we'll be good. And check, we're done. Uh, that's that's not helping the producer understand the why, the importance of the how, and and seeing the the difference in soils and ecosystems afterwards, uh, and learning, uh, and that's one of the things about the climate smart programs. I think is really going to try to address that and, and try to capture that data and and really, uh, you know, it's a four year program. Uh, and, and I just want to tell you, incentives-based programs shouldn't have never been designed to last four lifetimes. An incentive-based program is to help Monty uh, two to five years to understand the why, the how, and the results of that. And then you should be able to take care of yourself and move forward without incentives. And a lot of incentive programs over the years have, have just continued and uh, we get addicted, so to speak, to that revenue and, and that's all we focus on. And we don't understand really the why or the need to understand that and the benefits that we should be seeing later. So I think it's very critical at any of these programs across the country, uh, people take them seriously. If, if that company doesn't want to help you or to have the knowledge, a lot of the companies just flat dab don't have the agronomist or the knowledge to, to understand really how to help someone in a new system approach. There's a lot of people across the country and there's YouTubes, there's podcasts like this, there's uh, you know, literally now we have uh, dozens and dozens daily of options that you can get some resource to help you uh, on the ground or virtually to understand that. I think that that can help us if you're willing. But, you know, as one of John Wayne's famous last movies, uh, you know, not everyone's willing. Uh, but but you and I are. And so there's a lot of us out there. They're willing to help people and understand that. I think that's key. But there is a great opportunity for some greenwashing and just check the box. And, and please don't let yourself be sucked down that vortex. So it's a great, great, great way to de-risk uh, trying new things, you know, 
similar mm -hmm. to what the original intent of conservation security CSP right, conservation security program. That was a, that was a great program because you got uh, five years to try a new practice and put it in place and offset the cost of the new practice. Because once you buy the nitrogen toolbar or whatever it was that you did as a result of that, guess what? You own it. You're going to continue doing it years six and on. Um, so it, it's similar, you know, looking for opportunities to make your farm better is what you're saying, how to leverage this. Um, and then the other thing you're saying too is watch the length of the contracts because <laughs> there can also be things that you're signing up your great grandchild for uh, that you just don't know if you can adhere to, right? You know, 99 year stuff. Yeah, it gets gets a little old. Yeah, we have to do our due diligence as we're looking at any program to understand that. Uh, and yes, what well, you know, be careful signing up your future generation's ability to to own and operate uh, the farm in a responsible way as well. Uh, that that's always a big concern. <clears throat> that's the reason I never sign anything that that my attorney doesn't thoroughly look over with me. Uh, to completely understand the big picture. I, I think that's important because uh, we got to read every, every piece of it. So uh, not just, not just sign it because uh, we think the uh, salesperson has our best intentions in mind. All right. So uh, you think about this a little bit in the complexities of the commodity market and you get an advisor involved with that for, you know, options trading and, and futures and those kind of things and putting together a, a plan on marketing of grain and it can get a little complex. Uh, how does a farmer find out about all these opportunities that are out there? I mean, there's multiple angles, multiple things. There's opportunities to stack uh, certain incentives. There's opportunities where you cannot stack certain things. Um, you know, there's opportunities where you get paid for the practice. So if you've been no-tilling for 50 years, you know, you can get paid where others would say, nope, you got to switch to no-till. Well, I'm already at no-till. How do I switch to no-till? So the additionality concept, uh, yeah, links of contracts, additionality, um, stacking of contracts, knowing these various things. I mean, there's individuals coming at it from multiple different ways. How in the world does a farmer not just do a little, but maximize this opportunity. Because honestly, here's what I want my revenue picture to look like. I want a third of my gross profit of my farm coming from the crop I'm raising. I want a third of it coming from value added, whatever associated with those crops. I want a third of it coming from what I say, ecosystem services. So this would fall in the ecosystem services, something we're doing that is a benefit to somebody outside of our farm, whether it's a bird, a fish, somebody drinking water, somebody you know, not uh, sequestering carbon, those kind of things. How can a farmer maximize this, not just participate in a few things here and there? Well, there's there's critical key points we need to bring out here. And that's one of the reasons that I'm hiring people on the ground in these areas. First of all, <clears throat> at USDA, you cannot receive a payment for the same practice on the same acre. So if you're no-tilling, all your acres, you can't sign up in a, a new no-till program to start no-tilling. Get out the ripper, man. Let's go. Nope. Yeah, let's let's don't even talk about that, Monty. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, <laughs> give me give me one chance to you know get out there and just rip it up. It's been twenty five years. You know, just have the okay. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> yep. Well, that's the reason that we have an early adopter uh, area in our grant that if you've been no-tilling, but maybe you haven't been cover cropping or you've been no-tilling cover cropping, but you haven't been grazing or maybe you've been grazing, but you have been rotationally grazing or maybe you haven't tried virtual fencing uh, before and some new practices. So there is ways to, to, to do multiple things on that acre, but a different different thing than you've been doing. I, I think that's key things that producers need to, to, to look for. There's lots of opportunities uh, out there. Uh, you know, there is uh, carbon markets that you can stack on other other markets that's coming available now. Uh, there's a lot of ecosystems markets uh, being developed for water and, 
and like you said, there's there's wildlife opportunities and hunting leases and lots of different things if you choose uh, to do different agritourism. Uh, you know, have people come into the farm. If you're selling value added products, you know, have them on the farm to sell. There, there's a tremendous amount, just like you said, lay out a plan for your farm and ranch to stack enterprises uh, in different revenue streams uh, to, to get some great value uh, and profitability added to the farm outside that traditional commodity livestock frame that we've always uh, been in. And that's that's the opportunity we have today. Once again, it's not shake and bake easy. You really need to watch, watch your signing, what you're doing, and, and really plan uh, with the people that you're dealing with. And if they don't want to plan and understand and, and work with you a little bit, red flag, red flag, you know, don't don't just take the money and sign the contract and then find out um, I made a grave error. Um, that's going to be really important. But man, what an opportunity uh, to enhance your farm and ranch over the next four or five years, and then just continually move up the ladder uh, from there on your own, and hopefully stimulate ideas and thoughts about how you know I can grow. Like you said, that that second, third, how how do I how do I make that grow? How do I change that to be more profitable? If I got an ecosystems market plan, uh, you know how how can I uh, do better with that? You know, I've got a great friend in, in Europe that's had uh, farm tours for several years. Regen Ben. Now he's having silent tours to the farm where you leave your cell phone in the car. There's no talking. Uh, he sold out for two years in advance besides the other regular tours that he has. And he just keeps stacking revenue on. He's, he's selling drinks. He's selling food. He's selling products and beef and lamb and, and flowers and everything uh, as people come to do that. And, and now you have uh, that old saying, if you have seven streams of revenue coming in, uh, you know, you're a lot more successful in the end in retirement than if you have one or two. So, you know, take advantage of this time period to build something like that. That's a great point. When you have seven revenue streams, you can, uh, you can handle a revenue drought a little better. That's right. It's a good point. However, Jimmy, I am disappointed. I'm going to have to sell my no fence collars. Uh, and I'm going to have to sell the cattle herd and I'm going to have to quit planting cover crops and till so I can, I can start out from the beginning. That's what, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> well, you're but just an neat, over, but you're an neat, overachiever, Monty. No, no, no. I, I, so what I think is really amazing about this, my point is, is that all these things we've been talking about and, and you for, you know, a long time, um, the payments are aligning with these principles and it, it's not just a bunch of hot air that we've been preaching right. for a long time. It's um, there, there's, there's the government and, and private industry is putting uh, money where the mouth is. Right. And that's right. That's jet that is pretty exciting. Yeah. And you know, I'm going to pick on you a little bit. That's a perfect example of someone that's that's doing a great job that still wants the revenue, try to figure out uh, some more than payments uh, come in. And, and, and quite truthfully, you're the perfect example of what we want to see at the end of this grant to someone that that has a plan that has all the, the tools in the box uh, that they have available to them and still looking for more uh, to enhance that. And I think that's how we progress this on a scale is we try to get everybody up to speed. At least it's at one practice and, and maybe more, but to understanding the principles and, and then showing the data to them that says, wow, you went in the last five years from a half percent of organic matter to possibly a, a percent. And with that, half percent gain or more it could be more it could be less depend on your area the the benefits of that from water holding capacity and for water 
infiltration, carbon storage, uh, you know, the system coming alive. And the longer we go, the better that gets. So then we start retaining soil instead of losing soil. So Farm Journal um, received the grant. I mean, how this is this is kind of a this is more than media, right? How, why was there an interest there with that? <clears throat> so, like I said, Farm Journal is a is a a big company anymore with, with nine, ten magazines, television shows, podcast. Uh, I mean, we, we are a a a big uh, corporation of, of different companies. Uh, and they decided, um, uh, looking into the future, uh, how they feel the need, we feel the need to assist farmers like we've been doing for 150 years with, with farm journal magazine, with ideas to stimulate thought, new technologies. Uh, and so that's the reason they created trust in food to look at the regenerative side of agriculture. And, and try to assist producers in making the shift uh, over at a comfortable level of understanding uh, with our 150 year history of, of trust that we try to put out a valuable product uh, in all our uh, lines of communications uh, of the vetting process of the right people to work with and the right ideas that we think are tools that you can use. And so that's the reason they created Trust in Food, because we see the shift in consumers. And you talked about there's more people on the planet. There's more people coming across our borders uh, in huge numbers uh, that are typically not producers, they're, but there are more people to feed. So we have to do better, you know, and I, you know, for years they've been saying about the nine billion dollars and how we're going to feed the world and farmers is always talk about feeding the world well we you know there's different ways to look at that but the bottom line is we got less land to work with with urban sprawl growing out uh, we're letting land erode away so the challenge is you know how do we save that how do we make that uh, more productive how do we make that more profitable so we can stay and do the business so our children have the opportunity to come back uh, and stay in rural America instead of urban America. Um, and, and how we do that is stacking enterprises and opportunities on the land where we're at for more revenue and more jobs to be created locally. Um, you know, there's a perfect example of our work uh, with Aaron Martin in Northeast Tulsa. Uh, we're uh, a doctor in, in physicians and clinics have uh, figured out that food can be medicine. And if you prescribe the right food, uh, instead of a chemical medicine, uh, your body is, is healthier. But when you do that, then there's an opportunity for someone to grow local, fresh food for them prescriptions. And what an opportunity for small operators and even larger operators that wanted to add another enterprise on uh, to really change someone's life, change your revenue. And so, uh, and, and, and keep children and keep communities thriving and more jobs locally uh, to, to really infuse uh, that small uh, area around you in community uh, with new life. It's, 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 all, it's all about the soil, but it's all about the life in the community around that. And so I think there's a tremendous opportunity we have now to start understanding on the food side. Well, some of us have learned on the, the, the soil side that, you know, high chemical use uh, is not the, 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 always the answer to fix the problem. It, it normally causes another issue or two. Same way with medicines, a chemical uh, medicine solution might fix uh, your heart rate or your blood pressure, but then how does it affect your liver or your kidneys or your other functions? And so it, it's an all big circle that we need to start trying to understand. And I think if you really look at them communities that are successful in doing that, you see that rural 
small community come to life. You make a great point, and it just uh, popped in my head that every time that you have, last night as we are watching local news, and I commented to Robin, I said, every other commercial is a drug. And I just, uh, it's just uncanny. And then, uh, especially when you're in a certain parts of the season, of the local news, especially around weather time, that's when you get the ads for uh, farm products, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, seed treatments and uh, fungicide and herbicides should almost have the same uh, uh, disclaimers to them that all the the medicines do, right? Where a one minute medicine commercial has 20 minutes where they're talking about med or 20 seconds where they're talking about the medicine and 40 seconds when they're talking about all the side effects probably should have the same thing for uh, certain fungicides, insecticides and, and herbicides, right? Yes. I mean, it's, uh, it's much needed to really understand that, but they run very parallel to, to the same, uh, you know, our soil is, is the gut of the planet, just like our gut is, is, our way of functioning we have to have it without that it won't function so they run very parallel and and pulling the test and making a chemical recommendation has not worked out too well uh in in the overall picture now i'm not saying that you know throw all your drugs out today and you'll be fine i'm saying there's there's a way to look at that and look how you eat uh and how you till your land, how you conserve your land, how you operate and try to reduce some of that and see how that goes uh, and, and lessen that spending impact and lessen the, the killing impact uh, of both them systems, whether it's your gut or the, the soil's gut to really understand uh, what we're doing. And it, it's amazing when you get a doctor and, and a producer together and you start talking about these two and, you know, I pull a soil sample. I, I traditionally get a chemical recommendation to fix a symptom or lack of a nutrient. I pull blood. I make a chemical recommendation to fix a deficiency or correct a, an over uh, amount of something. So it's the same, it's the same technology that we've used. And when you get both of them to get, Together, it's like uh aha uh -huh. oh i i never thought of it that way and and it's very parallel yeah very very interesting i it really stuck out to me visiting with Dwayne beck once when he said we're just in the business of playing whack-a-mole you know this pops up and whack it with this and uh versus just stepping back and and uh looking at the system as a whole yep. all right tell me um Tell me a little more about when when you're. I know farmers don't retire, but uh, let's say uh, when it, when it comes time to retire, um, um, whether intentionally or unintentionally, right? Um, what do you what do you hope your impact will have been as a result of all your all the work that you've done here? That that's a tough one, and and you know the older I get, the more I I think about that. Um, and we talk a little bit about legacy and, and, you know, we have one son, he's in the medical business in the field, two and a half hours away from us. Um, I don't see him coming back. He's very successful and, and he's helping people, uh, a great mission and a great vision. Um, and I'm happy for him. Uh, we have a grandson that's pretty interested but once again, when you grow up with all the amenities uh, that you need a few blocks or 15, 20 minutes away from you to move back to Pawpaw's farm where it's 40 minutes to a city to get groceries or an hour to go eat somewhere really special, uh, that's not always enticing. And so what Ginger and I have chose to do, and we've got a young man that's been working with us for 15 years that I hired out of college. Um, uh, doesn't have any family uh, left much. His dad's still alive, but very old and, and four states away. Uh, you know, how do we help him if he wants to to stay? He's helped us build it. He gets 
long live the soil. He's helped me build presentations in the early years. He 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 practiced what we preach. Uh, and so we've talked to our son and and we're going to we're going to fix it where if Carson wants to stay uh, and operate the farm, I think that would be a, a, a very, very wonderful outcome. But I've also instilled in my son and my grandson, you know, if they choose to keep the land and I'm not going to try to to control it beyond Jimmy. Uh, to be thinking about the, the next stewards and 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 try to instill in them as operators that, you know, this is what we want. And we want to continue our conservation efforts and our regenerative efforts uh, and, and be selective. Just don't take the money uh, once again and be content as an investment and an income. Understand, be a part of it. So we're trying to build that in. And then that's in the immediate nucleus of Jimmy and Ginger's farm. What I hope to to that people will look back and at all of us that that has worked in this arena that travel relentlessly across the country, uh, sometimes with personal cost of at, at homework, uh, you know, just personal things that you don't get done because you're helping someone else that can look back and say, "Hey, you know, Monty helped me." Jimmy helped me, uh, I need to help somebody else. I need to pay it forward. Uh, man, what, what a legacy that would be. I think it's very important. Uh, we, we've lost a lot of that across our country in the last hundred years of, of helping one another, so to speak. Uh, we're, it's all about me or I. And uh, if we could instill some of that legacy down the road, uh, I think that would be very powerful. And, and regardless how all that turns out, I wouldn't change a thing. Uh, I've, I've, I've said uh, when I was at the Conservation Commission, when we started the soil health movement in Oklahoma, I call it stepping on the gas, uh, full speed ahead. Let's, let's figure this out. Let's get the partners in. Let's, let's try to collect the data so that when we're talking about this, it's believable. We have the data. It's not a fad. It's not a, a gimmick. It's not a, a quick buck here and a quick buck there. It is really uh, for the good of your operation and, and the operations of all involved. So that's that's our goal. Uh, some of it may be a little bit selfish around the home, but we also... We, we want to leave some young person that doesn't have the opportunity that, that we had uh, to maybe have a legacy. They're expecting their first child uh, now. And, uh, you know, that'd be pretty cool if, if, if our own family can't come back and, and, and thrive there, if they want to, given that opportunity, I think that's okay too. And our, our kids are fine with that as well. I think that's something good for other farmers to consider what your approach is there as far as teaching your your son, grandson, the principles so that they can be an active part of it, not just a not just a check receiver. Because there's there's more and more, you know, non owner operator land every day. And um that there needs to be an effort uh to educate those non uh, owner operators uh, about what the operator's doing. And uh, just because we might get a little bigger check today, it'd be really nice to have a farm a couple generations from now. So. That, that's, that's absolutely right. And, and one of the good things about my son, he's bought land uh, around us that joined us. We, we manage a 50 cow herd, 60 cow herd of his uh, as well. So he's actively involved uh, in, in, you know, the operations of what's going on. And, and we keep working with the 11 year old grandson, about you know, these are, this is yours and this is your dad's and, you know, really digging for worms when we go fishing and, and understanding, uh, start building that awareness. 
because they are removed. Uh, and if we don't infuse them like our parents did uh, with that knowledge of how to take care of the land and how to take care of yourself and streams of revenue and managing money, uh, you know, then we're not parent preparing for that legacy. Uh, there, there's there's more to legacy than just leaving them a piece of property or dollars that 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 you've saved or built over the years. It's it's the knowledge that that you can share uh, of how they can learn and and move forward and and have a life of their own uh, in a positive way and an ecosystem and a farm and soil uh, as a a very good uh, revenue source and an investment for the future. Well said. Um, only suggestion is keep digging for worms. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So it sounds like a, a great family activity, a great way to teach and, and learn and enjoy the, enjoy what you do. So Jimmy, anything else we should have visited about while we had some time together here today? You know, uh, I think we've touched on a lot of a lot of points. I I think just get connected to your to your soil and your land more would be my my outreach and my outcry to producers. A lot of times we we walk the crops, we we do that. You know, looking what's above the ground, how the crops growing, how the how the water the amount of rain we get, uh, you know, the estimated bushels or income that we may have coming in. But there's a lot below your feet to learn about as well. If you got that three inch rain, did you really get it? Or did you just get a half inch of that or an inch of it? And if that left, what left with it? Uh, it was that a nutrient or a chemical I put on What's the effect to my neighbor, my city, my my water source down the, the stream, uh, and how to keep them earthworms? If you don't have earthworms and activity that you can see in your soil, uh, you need to be learning why, and to really start understanding that that whole thing. And the best part of my day when I get home. We're in budget meetings here in South Bend, Indiana, the last three days at corporate. And the best part I'm looking for this weekend when I get home is to go out and uh, look at some cattle, move some cattle around and sit down and enjoy a drink and listen and, and observe what's going on. And most of the times, most producers are too busy or think they're too busy to do that. But five minutes, 10 minutes, I like longer, but just take a few minutes for yourself and your land and, and listen to it and, and have a little conversation uh, with what's going on there. I think will help you understand the why for Jimmy and Monty, we do what we do. And if you will do that, I think you'll have a, a great life. Well, you heard it here. The two best things that uh, you can do, uh, and Jimmy and I agree on this, is put uh, put your shadow and a shovel in your field and uh, go go exploring. So a lot of you listen to this driving down the road. First field of yours you come up to, just stop. Take five minutes. Be late for your next appointment. Get the shovel out. Go dig. See what you got going on. Just take a moment of intentionality to see. So I think uh, you would encourage that, wouldn't you, sir? I would. I would. I carry a shovel uh, almost everywhere I go. I didn't bring it on the plane this time, but I've been known to to uh, carry a shovel on the plane where I knew there was a, a need for that. Uh, and actually, over the years, uh, we've given away uh, hundreds of shovels uh, in, in contest winners and people that come to the to the farm or a uh, jeweler's uh, uh, uh scope so they can look a little bit deeper in the soil uh it's the small things that add up and and that's the reason long live the soil is so important to understand just be careful carrying one into the bank they might think they're being robbed so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right jimmy thank you so much for uh all that you do um your heart for growers and your heart for the soil 
and uh, how you in this new role are going to be able to extend your your outreach, education, and mission to help farmers implement practices that are truly great for them and great for all of us. So thanks, Jimmy. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Monty. Long live the soil. It has to. Yes, it does. Take care. Take care. Thanks again for listening. Jimmy is more than an advocate for these conservation programs. He's leading by example. And as always, if you'd like to learn more about what we're doing to help growers take the lead and implement soil health practices, check out our website at asn.farm. And there you can click on links to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. There's a lot of great things happening and always something to learn. Thanks for listening.